So for a comprehension check for chapter four, part two, we're gonna start learning something called a Lewis structure. And a Lewis structure is a Lewis dot diagram that helps show you where the valence electrons are on elements. We've talked in the past about how these are the outermost electrons. These are the ones that are gonna be interacting. Now, for question seven, they give you potassium. They also remind you that potassium is a K. So to determine its outer valence electrons for the S and the P, which is the ones we're gonna concentrate, so this whole column has one valence electron. This one has two valence electrons. We're gonna not look at the Ds right now because the Ds can actually change a bit. And, but for the Ps, this is a three valence electron column, four, and you can see my numbers on across through eight. So if you're having potassium and K, we're gonna write its dot structure. We're gonna find where it's at. And so K is right here. I just realized that I've had these backwards for like the whole time. So we're just gonna <laughs> fix those. Um, so we're gonna do potassium and it is in the group one column. And so it has one valence electron. So you just write the symbol, which is K, and you're gonna put one dot above it. That's how you draw a Lewis structure. That shows potassium has one electron. Now, we're gonna work through some of these and I'll show you the method for filling it in when it has more than one. Before part B, we have carbon. Carbon is down here and it has a, I wrote a four above it. So it has four valence electrons. Now, when you're drawing in valence electrons, you're gonna draw in some like this. We will eventually start to pair up when an element has more than four electrons, but from one to four electrons, you just draw them all separate around the four dots around the carbon. All right, for 7C, we have arsenic. Arsenic is down here, and it is like this third column off, and so I have a five written above it. It has five valence electrons. So you write the chemical symbol for arsenic, which is AS, not AR. And we're gonna fill in our five electrons. Remember, we do the first four all the way around. And when you have more than four, then you start to pair them up. So arsenic has five. Now the next one they give you is iodine. I added it down here on my periodic table. And so it is in the seven group. And so it has seven valence electrons. So its symbol is I and you're gonna fill in the first four separately, and then you come back around and pair them up. And so iodine has three pairs and one that is not paired up. Elements are trying to get eight valence electrons. If it has eight valence electrons, it is happy, it is stable, it is where it wants to be. So these elements will actually give away electrons or pull in electrons and take electrons to get to the eight valence electrons. So if it only has like one valence electron, it can either give its one away or it can take seven more. Well, it's actually easier to give its one away. But if it has seven valence electrons, it's a lot easier for it to take one to have eight. So these compounds are gonna be taking and giving away electrons. So question eight gives you four elements and it wants you to tell the ion that they would form. Now an ion is either they've given or accepted electrons. And it says you don't have to draw the Lewis structure, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that for you. So the first one we have is bromine, which is all the way down here at the end in the group seven. And so it has seven valence electrons. So we're gonna put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, in order to be happy, it would have a total of eight valence electrons and four pairs. And if you'll notice, bromine is just one shy of that. And so it will easily pull in another electron to it. And so when we do this, we get a bromine ion, if we were to pull in an electron here, and you would write it Br, so you would write this ion as Br1 minus, because one minus is like a negative charge, and, or one negative charge, and that's adding electrons. So this means it is taken into it one electron. So let's do more practice. Let's make an oxygen ion here. So oxygen 
is in group six, so it has six valence electrons. I don't have to draw it, but I'm going to for you, four, five, six. So it has two pairs and has two spots where it wants a pair. So it is gonna easily pull two electrons to it. And so the oxygen ion would be written O for oxygen, two negative, because when it pulls in, it's two more electrons, it gets a negative charge. All right, let's look at calcium, the calcium ion. Calcium only has two valence electrons. So it has these two electrons out here. Now it can either pull in six electrons or it can give away its two valence electrons. And it's actually a lot easier to give away two. So it's just gonna lose these two. And so when we write that, as it's, it's losing two electrons or two negative charges, we would write a two positive because it's lost two negative charges. And when it loses its two negative charges, it becomes a positive charge. So the next one, the last one we're gonna do is cesium. And I have not added cesium, but it would go right down here. So cesium would have one electron there and to turn it into an ion, it's gonna just give that ion, that electron away instead of taking seven. And so when it gives away electron, it loses a negative charge, so it is, becomes one positive charge. Question number nine says that metals are good at losing electrons while non-metals are good at gaining them. How well do metalloids do? Well, if you're looking at your periodic table, the yellow here on my periodic table, these are metals. And especially like these where it has one electron or this one that has two electrons in this column, they're gonna easily give away those electrons in order to have eight valence electrons. They're gonna give away those two. Down here in the purple, we have our non-metals. And those are like, those. these have our sixes, a lot of these have our sevens, and so they're easily going to gain an electron to have a eight valence electrons. But we do have this stair step here that's green on my periodic table, and these are called metalloids. And so they have some properties of metals, some properties of non-metals. They're kind of right down in the middle. And the question's asking, what do I think metalloids do? Do they give away electrons or do they take? They actually do both. They can give some and they can take some, but they don't do either very well. Question 10, we're gonna learn how to make ionic compounds. And so it gives you two elements, lithium, and sulfur, and we're gonna combine these together to make a compound. Now, an ionic compound is a compound that forms when elements either give away electrons or take electrons. So you're gonna have, when you have an ionic compound, you have a metal, which is lithium, and it's gonna be giving away electrons, and you're gonna have a non-metal, which in this case is sulfur, and it is taking electrons. So if we were to look at lithium, it has one, it has a one valence electron. And if I look at sulfur, it has six valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, so lithium is actually gonna give this electron to the sulfur. So I'm just gonna redraw it and scoot it over here because sulfur is wanting to. Now I still have this one electron down here. And so in theory, say we have mixed in a beaker, lithium and sulfur. Another lithium will come up here and give its electron to this sulfur. And so it would take two lithiums to make this sulfur happy. And so we would write this chemical formula, Li, and you would write a little two with an S. And so this is the compound formula and its name, so you keep the name of the metal, and of the non-metal, you drop the ending and you add IDE, so it would be lithium sulfide. So when you give the name of it, you don't mention the two, but you do put the two when you write the formula. So let's do another one of these. All right, so for part B of 10, they give you calcium and chlorine, and they're asking you to write the name of the compound and the formula. And so calcium, got it in the right column this time, is the second column, so it has two valence electrons. 
and you'll see chlorine all the way down here with seven valence electrons. So what's going to actually happen is chlorine wants one more electron. So this calcium is going to scoot on over and share its extra electron with chlorine. But if you'll remember, calcium had this other electron hanging out there. Well, what it can happen there is another chlorine can bond with it. And so this other chlorine will come in and therefore it will be happy. So we're going to end up with one calcium and two chlorines. Now, if you get stuck on drawing this, you can look at this and say calcium has is on the second row, so it's going to be giving away two electrons. So let's say if we put a two plus up here and chlorine has seven and it's going to be wanting to take in one. You, I hope you can think this through that it's going to take two chlorines to be able to take the two calcium electrons. And so we would write this calcium chloride, drop the ending of the last one to make it IDE, and the metal goes first. And since you have two chlorines, it would be CaCl2 is the formula. So we have one more for question number 10. If you're totally lost on these and you're like, I'll just skip it, I don't need to know this, this is going to come back in many chapters in the future. So I would highly recommend getting this concept down. Aluminum is down here. It is a three plus, which means it's giving away three electrons because it is a metal. Metals give away electrons. And then we have nitrogen, which is in the five column. So let's draw aluminum down here with three electrons to give away. And nitrogen. Since nitrogen has five valence electrons, it wants to take in three. Right? It has a spot here. One, two, three. Well, aluminum can give these three. You're going to see nitrogen. You're going to see it written as three minus because it can take in three electrons. And so these combine together. So these combine together just in a one to one ratio. So you just say aluminum and nitrogen. And we call this, remember, you name the metal and we say aluminum nitrite. One of the things you can do in your periodic table that may help you is you could say you could write plus one up here and a plus two. That lets me know that those are giving away one electron, giving away two electrons. You could also write a plus three up there. The fours, these are going to be your metalloids. They can add or subtract. For this column with nitrogen, you could put a negative three because it's wanting to take in three electrons. And oxygen is a negative two because it's wanting two electrons. And this row right here, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, always want to pull in one electron so they would become more negative. So if you wanted to write above it, that's the ion that those would make in a compound. Question 11 gives you three um, groups of elements and it wants you to know which one can make an ionic compound. So remember, an ionic compound, you need something that's going to give away electrons and something that's going to take in electrons. So you're looking for a metal and a non-metal. So we're looking for a metal and a non-metal. So we have here phosphorus and chlorine. Well, phosphorus is I have a negative three written above it, which means it's wanting to take in three electrons. And chlorine, I have a negative one, which means it's wanting to take in a negative electron. So phosphorus and chlorine are wanting to take electrons. Nobody's wanting to give any, so it is not going to make a compound. The second one you have is strontium and fluorine. So strontium is down here and it can, it is looking, it has a two plus, which means it makes an ion by giving away two electrons. And fluorine is down at the very end down here and it is takes in. So we do have a metal and a non-metal. And so this will make an ionic compound. We have one compound that will give away electrons and one that will take. So now with carbon and iodine, if you'll look down here, carbon is purple, it is non-metal, and iodine is also purple, and it is a non-metal. And so both of these 
are going to be taking electrons. Nobody's wanting to give it. So this is not gonna be a ionic compound. Question number 12 asks you to write the chemical formula for aluminum oxide. So I'm gonna look and see, I'm not gonna draw the Lewis structures for this, but if I look at aluminum and I see that it's under the three plus, so I'm just gonna write aluminum and I'm gonna write it above it, three plus, and oxygen is two minus. So aluminum is giving away three electrons and oxygen is taking two. Well, oxygen can't take all three that aluminum has to give it away. So this doesn't balance out right if we were to do one aluminum and one oxygen, right? That one aluminum is shoving at oxygen three electrons and oxygen's like only two. And so we balance this out by trying to make a total electron that are being given and the total electrons that are being accepted the same. I do that by having multiple aluminums or multiple oxygens. So what I mean by, if I have one taking a th giving a three and one taking a two, those have the common factor or the common factor of six, right? So three times two is six. So I can make aluminum. If I have two aluminums, they're giving away six total electrons. And then if I have three oxygens, they're going to be accepting a total of six oxygens, right? Three times two is six. And so a trick that people do is they say, when you write it, you swap the charges, you crisscross the charges, and that's how you write the compound. Question number 13, address these transition metals that we haven't talked about. So these metals down here in the middle, and there's more rows, actually can change their charge. They can change the amount of electrons that they're giving away. They're metals, so they're still giving away electrons, but they can change. And so we don't just put a number above it. You actually have to figure these out. And so for question number 13, they give you the compound and they're asking you to name it. Well, normally when we would write the name for this ionic compound, we would name this element, the metal, and then you name the non-metal and you drop the ending and you add IDE. But when you're dealing with a transition element, which is one is right here, you're gonna have to add a separate rule in there. And that's because the charge changes. We have to tell what the charge is. So in this compound, I know that oxygen is a two minus. How do I know that? Well, I know it has six valence electrons, so it's gonna take in two so that it has a total of eight. And so I don't know what Mn is but these have to balance out. So if oxygen is taking in two, magnesium, manganese must be giving away two. So the way that you note this in the name is you put the charge in parentheses. So you would write this manganese two oxide. And so anytime you're using a transition metal, you're gonna have to use parentheses for the charge in the name. All right, that finishes up the chapter four comprehension check questions. Stay tuned for the next video where we will go over the review questions.